Hi, welcome to the DRH show where I have wide ranging conversations with fascinating people. We talk about all things psychology, mental health and wellness. Today I'm joined by a licensed marriage and family therapist, Kevin Kervig. Thanks for joining me. That's nice to be here. Nice thanks, thanks for having me. Having me. It's a pleasure. Um, it's great to have you, Kevin. So tell us about your background, your story, and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Okay, well, I was one of those people that didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do in life when I was younger and um, had kind of a later life. I guess I was around 30 when I decided I want to be a therapist because I, I'd always liked children, and I thought I'd like to try to help uh, children, and I, I wanted to do something valuable and meaningful uh, in my life. So uh, this is what I arrived at. So I've been doing it ever since. So I guess it's 30 years or so. I just turned, I'll be 61 soon. So it's been a good career. I've done most everything you can do in the mental health field, program development and lots of counseling, uh, managed a lot of programs, done a lot of things. Um, I've done kind of community-based family therapy in the last 15 years or so because I'm really interested in kind of the larger picture so I've never been really happy with just, uh, you know, working with one person and one family at a time. Uh, I'm very much a, a community focused person. So that's been a big part of my fo focus over the last several years. And uh, in the States, we call that capacity building. So I'm interested in what a community would look like if it were, you know, growing healthy people, healthy children, especially. So I've, I've devoted some of my attention to that over the last several years. Uh, and that's taking me down a kind of socio-political direction as well, uh, because I'm very concerned about what I would consider to be kind of a deterioration of society. And I don't think that uh, therapists have necessarily helped. <laughs> to some extent, I think we've maybe hindered a little bit uh, the, uh, the healthiness of our community. So uh, my work of recent has been trying to reverse that. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, um, Kevin, I understand that predominantly you work within marriage counseling or couples therapy. Now, a lot of people might be asking, um, why do we need someone like you? Why do we need a counselor? Why do we, why do we need a couples therapist? Because usually we can just handle problems on our own. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, our ritual today is that we, we hire a, you know, a therapist, right? Uh, throughout history, Various cultures and communities have uh, used all sorts of people, shaman or wise people, you know, in, in villages, uh, priests, you know, ministers. But there's always really been a need for or people have always wanted to go to someone in their village that could help them heal or recover. Or in particular, when people weren't getting along very well, uh, there's always been a need to have a neutral person kind of be involved uh, to help with that because, uh, you know, entities are always going to struggle together and it can be really helpful to have a third you know, party in to, to help stabilize that. So, um, but having said that, I wish our communities were healthier such that uh, we, we didn't need to have as much therapy. Uh, we didn't need to have as much medicine. You know, I really feel like we are, um, you know, we're kind of a sick society that hires people to fix us. And, and I really wish we focused more on health and happiness and prevention. So kind of the implication of your question of people that might ask that is, um, yeah, I wish that were true. I really wish we could just really <laughs> rely on ourselves and our friends and our, and our neighbors a little bit more. Uh, but unfortunately, this is the way we do it now. And it probably is a function of the fact that we have become somewhat of a uh, sick society. And a little bit later, maybe I'll weave in the concept of uh, medical iatrogenesis to, to kind of... Uh, push this point a little bit further, but hopefully that answers your question, Dennis. Yeah. And what about medication? Would you say that it's a good alternative to therapy? I would say no. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those anti-medication zealots. Uh, I'm very concerned about uh, the reliance on medication, particularly the SSRI craze, which has been with us for, what, 20 years or so. Um, I think they overhype the effectiveness of all the medications. I think the side effects are stronger than they get credit for. And I think too often we go to a medication when we probably should be using a talking therapy. So I'm very concerned with adolescents getting SSRIs and 
uh, the potential increase for violent behavior and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm concerned about, you know, Viagra, the sexual therapies. I mean, I think these are really not good things. So uh, I almost never recommend medication for my patients. Uh, often it's them bringing it up. And then if they do, I'll help them, you know, talk to a medical professional. Uh, but not a big fan of the medications. And I, I think they're overhyped. And Kevin, of course, um, it, it's a known fact that so many psychotherapists, there's so many counselors, but what do you think makes your approach different? Yeah, so I call myself an old school counselor, and this is a bit of a shift for me. Um, I think we've gotten away from our core purpose in psychotherapy, which is identifying you know, problems, uh, deviant behavior, bad behavior, broken behaviors, and helping people fix them. Mm -hmm. you know, whether that's uh, healing or that's, you know, behavior change or, or, or whatever, but getting to a, a healthier place. I think we've moved away from that. And I think postmodernism, which I think you and I probably have the same critique of postmodernism, um, has brought us in the wrong direction. You know, we've lost track of reality. We've lost track of kind of naming what's wrong with people. And I think we've got into this place of everything is everything and everything is relative and our job as therapists is just to help people sort out their stories and their narratives and things like um i just don't think that's correct and i'm a very bottom line i would say um old school kind of person uh i'm, I'm honest with people uh, i'll tell them what i think and um i'm also not afraid to talk about you know morality and values uh when the situation calls for that so I'm a little bit more uh, pastoral, I guess, in that way, uh, but not pastoral in the touchy-feely, let me help you feel good way. Uh, more in the, like, there are boundaries in life and people around you expect you to have boundaries and you're not going to be happy if you don't uh, adhere to some sort of structure or boundaries in your life. And, you know, my job in part is to help you uh, do that better, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 61, you know, this is the way people move in life. We get a little bit more in touch with our, I guess, with our values and our morality as we get older. Uh, and I'm certainly um, on that trajectory. Uh, so that makes me a little bit different. I get excellent outcomes. Uh, I think um, it's rare where someone I'm working with doesn't get better. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying that because I measure them and I ask people uh, regularly how they're doing. And it's because if they're not getting better early on, or if it's a bad fit with me, um, we'll talk about that. And they won't even come to see me. Uh, and if they're not getting better during the process, I'll refer them or we'll move on. But I'm going to work really hard toward getting outcomes. And I'm very impatient uh, when people aren't getting better. So I have no tolerance for just sitting there talking to people for, for days on end. Uh, just because they're paying me. I, I have zero tolerance for that. I get bored with that. Uh, and so um, that makes me kind of different. People will say my approach is refreshing uh, for that reason. Uh, I'll just say, you know, when I, nothing's changing here. It's been, we've been going on this for three, four weeks. What do you think about the process so far? Uh, we'll make a decision. So uh, that's, that's what makes me a little bit different, I think, because I'm very much kind of old school in that, re in that respect. And I've got to be honest, this is the first time that I've heard um, a psychotherapist describe themselves as impatient, because usually they describe themselves as someone who's got an open ear and willing to, you know, yeah, to, to listen yeah. to, to their um, 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 client. Um, but it's, it's refreshing indeed to, to hear from you how you approach um, the psychotherapeutic process. But um, I was just wondering, Kevin, if you observe an increase in marital issues um, during the lockdown? Yes. Uh, I have anecdotal evidence. I think the divorce rate is really going to start climbing. I think we're in a lot of trouble. And I think, um, you know, couples, they, they tend to have a, a distancing mechanism that keeps their relationship in homeostasis. So I work, you work, we're here, we see each other two hours, we have the kids three hours, you know, that sort of works. I think that got all changed. I think that uh, too much time together, uh, too much, you know, uh, alcohol and drug consumption during the, during the COVID, um, the stress, anxiety. I think, I think definitely uh, we've seen a real increase in uh, marital therapy, I, marital problems. Um, you know, I get probably one or two referrals every day for couples looking for marital therapy. 
Um, and I, I just, my anecdotal sense is that that has really uh, increased over the last year. And my next question to you is, of course, we know it that it's, it's already a cliche to say this, that it takes two to tango. So um, fr from your experience, what can individual partners do to themselves to improve the dynamics of their relationship? The most important thing is kind of unpopular to say, but lowering your expectations. <laughs> you know, mar the, the goal of marriage is not happiness. This is where we've gone wrong in the current zeitgeist, right? Uh, we think everything in life is supposed to make us happy. So if I have a partner, you know, her job is to make me happy. If she's not making me happy, I got to get rid of her and I got to do something else, right? That's And that's completely wrong. That's not what, what marriage was uh, intended to be. The goal of marriage is marriage. It makes you a part of the community. It gives you a economic partnership. Uh, it gives you a life partner with whom you can develop, you know, kind of economies of scale, uh, and do great things together. It allows you a, a, a vehicle for having children. Uh, so marriage is a very practical institution in my way of looking at it. And we've turned it into a romantic institution, which I think is completely wrong. Uh, marriage should not be, a, you know, it's, of course there's romance in marriage, but that isn't the primary thing. Uh, particularly with younger people, millennials and younger, uh, they've got this whole soulmate thing that I'm supposed to find my soulmate and, if, if I'm not happy in any given moment, it's probably because you're not my soulmate. And they say, well, you're not my soulmate, so I have to go find my soulmate. And this is a terrible thing for marriages. So the best thing an individual can do, well, the first thing I think is to have, let's call them realistic expectations. Often that means lowering your expectation. Um, and the second thing you can really do on a psychological level is learn to manage your own emotional reactivity. So as far as I'm concerned, the most important emotional intelligence skill we have, it's not empathy, it's managing your own emotional reactivity because all the bad stuff in marriage happens when people are agitated and they're no longer in you know, prefrontal cerebral cortex mode, they're in limbic system, and that's when you know things go, go haywire. So those two things, realistic expectations, managing yourself, uh, in the relationship or the two most, I think probably every couple I work with, I talk about those things. Absolutely. And it, it is true that we actually make our worst decisions when we, we become so emotionally reactive. Yes. Now, Kevin, um, before this interview, actually, I navigated your website and I found something interesting and I called on your website, you said that in a social media driven information age that simultaneously avoids important ideas and saturates us with false information, I try to be both a spreader and a sifter. So how do you do that? Yeah, great question. So um, I'm a nationalist. Okay, so I'm, I'm really concerned about this kind of globalism. Um, I really don't trust any of the major narratives that are coming from the kind of global psycho, you know, pharmaceutical, you know, media complex. I, I just don't. Um, so I think essentially most of the information that people are absorbing is false. And false, not because it's misleading so much, but because they're just leaving out a whole bunch of very important things. Uh, the corporations, the governments control what the media are allowed to say and report, and therefore they're leaving a whole bunch of other stuff out. Uh, so I start with that assumption with people. And I'm, I'm now very clear, as you notice from my website and my informed consent is very, very clear with people. I, I want people to know where I stand, that I think we're living in this bizarre world of misinformation. And right? so people know that when they're coming to me, so they kind of know what they're getting. And I make them sign that informed consent so they know who I am. Um, so that helps already in the process because they're already uh, they already understand where I'm coming from with that. So, um, but I ask, I think, hard questions and uh, to allow people to think critically um, about the world. Um, I don't ask questions about things that are irrelevant. <laughs> so, you know, my questioning, I think, will help people um, become better um, kind of spreaders uh, and sifters. Um, but more often than that, if I can just get them to think more clearly, uh, slow down, um, get into good critical thinking mode, uh, they're going to see for themselves what is real uh, and what, what is not real. Um, but there are just times when I'm just going to flat out tell people or, 
you know, ask a very direct question. Uh, how did you come to that conclusion about what you're seeing? Um, or uh, particularly with marriage or something like that, I'll say, um, how did you arrive at that belief about marriage? Uh, and, and that often leads them to kind of talk about, well, what are my beliefs about marriage? And I'll say, well, if you allow me to tell you, if you're interested in my perspective, I'll tell you. Uh, and I usually lay out some kind of harsh truths there. Uh, owning them is my educated opinions, um, but I'll kind of lay them out there. So uh, I don't know if that's answered your question very well, um, but uh, that's, you know, kind of, I think what I'm trying to do is to, um, what do you call it, bias the witness or prepare the witness, the expression? I kind of want to prepare them before the therapy starts that I'm going to try to open their mind to a, 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 a way of looking at things that's going to be idiosyncratic or dissident or anti-establishment. Leading the witness, that's it, Dennis. I'm kind of leading the witness before we even start the therapy. Okay, absolutely. Now, um, Kevin, another thing that I noticed on your website is you were talking a bit about um, interpersonal wisdom approach. Um, could you please expand on what exactly is that approach? Yes, and I offer that a professional development workshop for therapists. I've, I've done it around the country in multiple states. Uh, it's, it's been a pretty effective approach. I've gotten a little bit away from it because I'm caught up in the kind of political zeitgeist right now, but this is my own unique approach. Uh, it's based on the common factors of psychotherapy. Uh, I was first introduced to them uh, through Scott Miller and Barry Duncan and those folks in the late 1990s, I guess, early 2000s. Um, the idea being that the specific factors we offer as therapists are far less salient uh, and curative than the, the common factors. So I really focus on the common factors and those are the strength of the relationship, um, other things happening um, in the, the person's life, um, you know, hope and expectancy for change. Um, um, am I able to get them to kind of slow down and, and think more clearly about a situation uh, with couples? Can I do a good systemic conceptualization. And so all these common factors that I, I think this is one of the only workshops that I'm aware of where I actually teach um, ther specific therapist factors that lead to good outcomes. And they're all based on the research and four or five of them are based on my, uh, my hopes based on the research because uh, I haven't done the research myself. But I'm teaching actual therapist skills and capacities that lead to good outcomes. Uh, that aren't the specific factors one finds in the postmodern therapies or in client-centered therapy or, you know, psychoanalysis or anything like that. So I think those are very, very insignificant, all these specific factors, you know, like transference analysis or, you know, you know, you know multi-directional partiality and, you know, that kind of thing. So I teach the common factors that if any therapist does, she or he will improve their outcomes. I do mock role plays. I, I explain, I show them how I do it. So I think it's a powerful workshop. I think it's been very well received. And at some point, if I can get past this sort of, you know, socio-political moment that I'm in, uh, I might dive back in a little more clinically. But folks can look at my website, kevinkervick.com, and find out about interpersonal wisdom. And I'll be glad to come to your organization or, or put, put a workshop together. But it's kind of my baby. It's, it's what I've done, my interpretation of the common factors and therapist factors that come from that kind of common factors philosophy. And it's, it's the way I talk about it. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing to us your website, Kevin. So what I'll do is I'll pop in um, the details of your website. So for anyone who's interested to learn more about that um, interpersonal wisdom approach, they can learn more about it. Now, um, Kevin, the other day I was talking to Dr. Brian Cutfield, who's also, um, 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 counseling therapists, a uh, marriage and counseling therapist. And um, on, a, on one of our conversations, we were actually talking about how long should you offer individual therapy? And it was interesting what um, Dr. Kahnfeld told me, he said that um, it should just relative, it should be relatively a short term process. Um, so I, I was just wondering, because you're on the same line of work, um, what, what's your take on that? How, how long should you have an individual therapy, because I understand aside from couples therapy, you also um, offer individual therapy. Should, should it be uh, a short process or should it be an ongoing process? Yeah, 
And thanks for that question. And, and then she mentioned I used the word impatient before. So I, I am an impatient kind of a person. So, and I'm a different Myers-Briggs type than most therapists. I'm an ENTJ. A lot of people will know what that is. So that's different than most therapists. Most therapists, I think, are INFP or something like that. And they, they really like the feelings. So lots of therapists love long-term you know, individual therapy because the, 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 the F part, the feeling part, they really like that. Uh, I am impatient with that. So that's my bias. Um, but I think with individual therapy, and I probably would agree with Dr. Canfield, I think you should see some progress uh, within about six to 10 sessions. You should see some progress. And I think if you see progress, uh, it, first of all, if you see no progress, six to 10, I think you should stop. I think you should refer or try something different, try something radically different or stop. Um, if you see some progress, then you need to make a decision. Am I at kind of a plateau now where I say, you know, this is a this is first order change, but it's kind of a good change. So let's say uh, somebody was in a bad place in terms of their work situation, uh, burnt out, disillusioned. And after seven or eight sessions, they're like, they kind of get, they kind of got their mojo back. And they're like, you know, I got it back. I know where it was wrong. I know what was happening. You know, I think I'm kind of in get a good groove again. At that point, you make a decision. Probably you want to stop, I think. Because when you hit that plateau, when you start pulling more layers back with people, you don't know where it's going to go. You know, it's like if you have like, um, you know, rot on a house where you're, the wood is, is wet. This is actually happening to my house now. So that's why I'm using this metaphor. Boy, you keep pulling the siding back. You're going to find more and more stuff. You may not want to know what's all back there. I think it's the same with people. When you get around that, you know, six, seven session mark, um, make an assessment. Am I at a plateau? Or it's probably good to stop, you know. Or is this the kind of person that made really good progress? And your assessment is they're, they're going to continue to grow. And they're going to really pull back layers in a very effective and efficient way. And they're going to become, a, you know, an excellent person and they're really gonna to wanna to grow um, with you in the therapeutic process. So for some people, I think it's fine to go on longer. I have one gentleman now, I think I've seen him for a year and a half or so. So, you know, probably 60, 70, 80 sessions. Um, and boy, I think he's hit six great plateaus. Like he's continuing to grow and make changes. Um, so I think it, you know, I don't mean to sort of avoid the question. I think generally, I think briefer is better. Um, but I think there are some clients, and you make that assessment, that are going to do well in um, longer-term uh, therapy, okay? So, um, but I think the research on this is therapists without feedback really don't know what's happening. Like, we, we tend to overvalue our importance. Um, we're, not a, we're not necessarily a good gauge of progress if we don't ask or get objective criteria feedback. Um, so... Um, and therapists in private practice are notorious for getting bad outcomes because they've gone on way, way too long. In fact, the research that I had seen is that psychologists in private practice are the worst. Uh, they tend to hold on clients way too long and they don't have enough feedback uh, from other colleagues like you would get in a clinic setting saying, you know, what's happening with that client? You know, you tend to hold on. And particularly if insurance is involved or people are paying, a lot of people in private practice just keep it rolling. Just keep it rolling. And I think that's that's problematic. Uh, okay. Um, absolutely. And I, I just want to go back to um, what you mentioned earlier, um, just for the benefit of the um, audience. Um, you mentioned that you are ENTJ. That's actually a personality type. So it stands for extroverted, intuitive, thinking, and judging. So that's um, Kevin Kervik for you. Um, he's an e -N -E -N -T -J, um personality type um, therapist. Now, um, on several points of, of our conversation, Kevin, you alluded to the fact that you have sort of a passion for um, um, politics. Um, so uh, I think you are alluding to the fact that political perspective tends to overlap the psychotherapeutic process. Um, what do you think that is? I, I don't think we did it. Um, and by we, I mean people like me. I think that the uh, progressive movement with this latest incarnation, you know, postmodernism and critical race theory, uh, they just, I think, contaminated everything we do with the politics. And I think it started with feminist family therapy, 
uh, a lot of the kind of pro-abortion therapists got really involved. Um, and then, you know, feminism became kind of an anti-male uh, kind of endeavor. Uh, I think the racial politics, I think those folks got all involved. So I think they've just overwhelmed our excellent profession with all of their political garbage, frankly, that I think is um, unscientific and wrong, uh, and they're pushing it. So these folks are trying to, of course, overwhelm every profession uh, with this, you know, uh, you know, I'll just call it an anti-white philosophy, which I think is basically what it is. Uh, I think that's what they're all about. Um, so I think they've done it to us. And so I have seen that happening. So I've taken a defensive posture uh, to push back. You know, I would sit in meetings, you know, earlier in my career and listen to these people go on and on about injustice and social justice and, um, you know, white men being the scourge of the earth and uh, all this. And I, at, at one point I just decided I'm going to actually start speaking up and, and talking back at these people and providing my alternative perspective. So once I started doing that, I guess I was kind of in and I felt like I needed to, uh, to push back. So I think we're in a dire place now where our profession is at risk of being completely overwhelmed uh, by leftist politics. Um, and I think we have to fight back. And where I'm a little different than others is, you know, um, most of us are saying, well, we need a, we need a value neutral position to um, push back against this incursion, this kind of Marxist, you know, critical social justice incursion on our profession. Uh, I don't think that's going to be enough. Uh, I, you know, that's why I'm a nationalist. I, I think it's going to take, you know, white men, frankly, and our allies, white women, um, other folks, you know, that at least don't hate whiteness <laughs> uh, to kind of come together and say, look, we're, we're tired of being pushed around. You know, we're going to advocate for who we are. And we think our civilization is actually pretty good. I know you hate us, you hate our civilization, um, but we think it's actually pretty good. We think there's actually been some great things done uh, uh, through what, you know, in Western civilization. And it's basically people like me that have done a lot of those great things. So I think we've got to uh, boldly push back from a place of identity. Uh, and I wish I didn't believe that. Uh, and I know a lot of people in the critical therapy antidote group don't believe that. Um, but I do. I, I think we're going to have to circle the wagons and push back from an identity you know, position only because I think we're getting slaughtered otherwise. I, I wish it weren't true. Uh, and I do think it's very much a defensive posture. Uh, I, I certainly didn't want to enter this fray, um, but I believe we're being steamrolled by some really evil uh, people with agendas uh, to destroy my civilization. So I think we have to push back. And I, I think... I think it's reached the point where we don't even know what is true anymore, what is real, um, kinds of suffering, uh, anxiety, depression is kind of off the chart. I, I read recently that, you know, personality disorders are now off the chart again. Uh, marriages are falling apart. And it's because of this incursion by these folks into the profession. Uh, I think they're destroying civilization, frankly, uh, because of their perspective. And I think we have to push back to save civilization from these these awful people whom I think um, are on these you know kind of power trips, uh, and so that's where I'm at. I, I you know, th this isn't the easy way to go, Dennis, because this is a much harder way to live. I mean, I have a really good practice. I could just sit back and do the clinical thing, and um, I'd be just fat and happy. I can retire nicely. It'd be easy. Uh, be easier on my family, easier on people that know me. But I, I just feel drawn. I'm pulled into this battle because uh, I, you know, I just see it as a battle for survival. Frankly, I think they're coming after us, and they're telling us they're coming after us. And I think we have to, you know, I think any man has to uh, stand up to that. I, I could really hear your passion about um passion to as what you've said, um, have a defensive posture against um, critical social justice theories, you've put it. But I just want to touch upon well, one of the points that you raised, because you said this critical social justice theory, they're coming from a place where it's no longer empirical, it's based on identity politics. 
Um, but um, on on the one side, you also mentioned that you're, you're also trying to you know protect your own identity as a white man. So how how does that reconcile? Because you you're also kind of attacking someone who's talking about their identity, and whereas you yourself, you also kind of you know um, have an uh, try, trying to present your, your your white identity as a white man. Um, how, how does that reconcile? Uh, and don't you think that you're also Essentially, don't you think that you're also the same as what you're opposing? No, I don't. And first of all, I, I love everyone. I'm a deep humanitarian. Uh, I have abiding love and respect for every human being. And that's the position I start from. Um, but I think, I don't think it's about free speech or freedom or allowing ideas uh, to flourish in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, I don't really think that's about, I think it's about what's effective, what's true, uh, what's enduring, um, you know, what works. And I think <laughs> the civilization that my people created, I'm just being very bold and very honest here, um, embodied those things. I think we have created a civilization based on truth and justice and effectiveness. Uh, we you know, we're great inventors. We built incredible cities, we built incredible, you know, countries. And I think we're losing that because people that hate us or are envious of us or uh, despise us are trying to destroy us. Um, and I think they're trying to destroy um, something amazing that people that I identify, identify with built. And I'm not saying we built it alone, of course, um, uh, we built it with the help of many others, and certainly uh, we had slavery in this country and uh, you know, took advantage of people that way, um, which we shouldn't have done. Um, but that doesn't detract from the fact that, that my people did do some awesome things and build some awesome things. So I'm coming at it from that position. What we have is tremendous, and we should be proud of it and talk about it, and we shouldn't lose it. Um, white people make up a very small percentage of the people in the world. And if things go the way they're going, we're going to be an extinct race uh, in a matter of several decades. Uh, and so that's where we are. We are. We are at a survival place and we have people that are pushing back at us. So uh, I'm an identitarian for that reason. I'm proud of my people. I'm proud of my ancestry, uh, my Irish heritage, my German heritage. I'm proud of what people from Europe have done. And I, I want to say I think it's great. And I don't want to say, um, oh, nobody should have an identity. You, you, you're too identitarian. I want to say, no, I think my identity is better than your identity. Right? So that's how I want to approach it. And I wish that white people would approach it that way rather than nobody should have an identity. I think that's silly. I think it's a losing argument. I'll also say I've traveled around the world and there are many other amazing places I spent uh, eight months in Japan um, three years ago, and I was blown away um, by the incredible civilization that you find in Japan, uh, the, the high intelligence. Uh, the kids were wonderful. They were so well behaved, the sense of respect. So in many ways, the civilization that they've built in Japan is better than what we have here in the United States or the rest of Europe. So there are many wonderful places around the world um, but I think we have to push back from the perspective of what's excellent, what's working well, and let's preserve those things, and let's stop being ashamed and embarrassed by it. In therapy, um, I see a lot of disempowered, you know, flaccid, um, you know, going nowhere loser, you know, white men and women who have been beaten down by a world that's telling them that they suck, you know, and I think that's awful. I want to do the opposite. I want to say we're awesome, we're excellent, and we should be doing really well. There are other awesome, excellent people in the world too, and we are among them. And let's highlight what we do and let's be happy with it. So um, I've seen people in my practice, uh, you know, a lot of middle-aged white men, you know, 24-year-old boys on video games, and pot and pornography, that have just been beaten down. Um, they're told that they're crap. And I try to help them realize that they're not that they're great people, they're from a great civilization, and they should be proud of it, and they should advance what's already been terrific and move that even 
you know, forward. So people are getting better in, in therapy with me because they're sensing that, wow, I mean, I don't have to feel bad about myself. I don't have to feel constantly guilty. I shouldn't be ashamed of what my people did. I can actually be proud that I'm a white man or that I'm a white woman or that I'm a, you know, wow, it's like a, a total different way to think, you know? So um, I think, I, I try to say this sometimes with the critical therapy antidote group, and I know this is not the prevailing philosophy there. So I own that. And I say, this is what I believe, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, but I also understand that that's not the perspective that's going to sell very well with a, you know, kind of a, um, a, a heterodox kind of group. Um, but that's just what I believe. Uh, I believe that we need to, um, you know, be who we are. And, and I think any person in life should be confident and proud of who they are and where they come from. Um, and I think that's not identitarian. I think that's just normal. I think anything else is neurosis. What white people largely experience and how they express themselves and how they live in the world today is essentially a neurosis. We're living in a neurosis. And that's why we're so easily beaten back all the time. You know, it's like beating back somebody that doesn't have a spine uh, because of the, the collective neurosis. So I probably answered that too strongly, um, but that was a direct answer to your, your excellent question. Dennis. Thank, thank you. Well, what were you what you were saying about um, you know being able to be proud of your identity? Um, it sort of resonates with me because um, I'm, I'm obviously I'm I'm not from a majority white country. I'm originally from from the Philippines, but when I came here, I was proud of you know choosing this country to to be my home. And if I could just share. There's actually some people here who kind of discourage people from putting um, the union flag. And because I choose to live in this country, I'm, I'm proud to you know, have a union flag in our house. And just like what you've said, we have to be proud of identity. We have to be proud of you know, the, the nation that we choose to call home. But um, I, I was just wondering, Kevin, because um, you, you mentioned that you, you yourself, you would say that you are proud, or as you put it, um, being an, an awesome, you know, an awesome nation and awesome collection of people. But what do you think these people who tend to disagree? Where do they, where where do they come from? Um, um, I, I suppose. Um, how, do you have any theory of how this all started? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's largely envy. I think if you look around the world and look at the civilization that that European peoples built, it's pretty, pretty cool. I mean, uh, it's on par with other civilizations like, you know, like Japan and, the, you know, the emerging China now, for instance. I mean, it's pretty cool. And we built an amazing thing. And I think there are other people that are um, envious. I think critical race theory is largely built on entitlement, envy, and overvaluation of self. And I think it's people that see, saw the success of white civilization, white people, and said, I want some of that. What can we do psychologically to disempower these people so we can take their money, their status, and their stuff? Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're, what it's all about. I think that's what critical race theory is. It's a you know kind of a Marxist deconstructionist philosophy that says, this people has a lot of stuff. How are we going to get that? And let's figure out a way to exploit them, use psychological warfare uh, to get as much stuff. I think there are elite you know, global capitalists, global Marxists, people um, who uh, are using all the power they possibly can to do what I just said, uh, to disempower white kind of European civilization, uh, move as much money, status and stuff to other other peoples. Now, um, Kevin, let's go back um, to what you were doing, um, couples therapy. So um, do you have some, some of the people who would be listening to this interview, they're actually trying to you know, think about what they would like to do with their life, what career they would um, sort of do. So um, do you have any tips of anyone who wants to follow your footsteps of being a therapist? Yeah, I mean, I think couples therapy um, is, is almost not really psychotherapy. It's, it's a very different animal. We're doing like crowd control a lot of times and a lot of psychoeducation, normalizing things, you know, directing things. It's it's a very different uh, different kind of animal, I would say. Um, so I think you have to be um, if you want to be a couples therapist, it's a diff very different skill set, I would say, than other kinds of therapy. So I think that's that's one little tip I would uh, recommend people take a look at. Um, I would say, you know, if you're impatient like me, <laughs> you know, 
it's it's not easy to just sit there all day uh, and talking to people, right? It's, you know, I, I know some therapists, they see like 12 people a day. I mean, that's a lot of work. I mean, you're listening. It, it takes a lot of emotional, atten- you know, emotional energy uh, to do that. And then I think also the burnout factor is, is relatively high because um, we don't see the fruits of our labor very often. So particularly in individual therapy. So you might go three, four, five months, nothing really is changing or maybe little changes. And that can be really hard on the psyche. You know, we're not like carpenters or, you know, uh, hairstylists or electricians who, you know, see progress all the time. I mean, we don't always see progress and that can be really difficult. You have to be the kind of person that's willing to do that. The other thing is uh, the, the documentation. So, uh, if you're in a clinical setting in the United States, I'm not really sure how it is uh, around the rest of the world, but the documentation is completely um, out of control. Uh, clinicians are spending now about half of their time on documentation. So if you don't have those organizational skills, you're gonna struggle because there's demands to get stuff done and get it done on time. And it's very linear the way we have to do things. So I think you have to be really careful that you know, you have those skills because that is unfortunately uh, a big part of the work today. But what I would say on the positive side, it's a very rewarding profession. Uh, when I look back at some of the successes I've had, some little three-year-olds I work with that got made great progress and would run in and grab my leg and say, you know, Mr. Kevin, thank you for helping me. You know, couples that would you know call and say, you know, marriage is still together. Just want to let you know. You asked all the right questions and, you know, you kind of laid it straight and we're doing we're doing better. And, you know, thank you so much. Um, That makes me feel good. And I, you know, I feel like, you know, if you embrace the role the way I do, which is that we're, you know, we're part of the community, you know, from a Christian perspective, you know, we're we're kind of offering grace. I mean, we're you know, we're, we're a conduit. It's God and it's the client and it's us, you know, and we're we're kind of a conduit. We're. We're kind of offering grace with people and we're witnessing their struggles. It's, it's an awesome, uh, exciting, powerful thing. I tell clients every day, you know, thank you for sh- telling me a story. I, mean, I feel I, I'm honored to hear what your life is about, or what you're going through, and I'm honored to be able to sit with you while you're, while you're doing that. So um, it's very meaningful work, what we're doing, you know, uh, very meaningful. There, there aren't a lot of other professions probably that are as meaningful uh, as this, because we're directly involved with, you know, life and death every day, marriage, you know, divorce, not marriage, you know, kids surviving in school, or not, you know, we're involved in really big, important stuff every day of our career. And that's, that's a really meaningful uh, thing to do. So if you're out there thinking about getting in, forget all the political stuff I just said, and focus on the fact that the profession itself, if we're just allowed to do it, uh, is very meaningful and very powerful. So I would highly encourage you to think about it. Absolutely. Now, Kevin, um, we're already nearing towards the end of this interview, and I've just got five questions left. Um, we already heard that you know that the line of work that you're doing and your views about um, what you said, the encroachment of, of ideology of political bias um, within the therapeutic landscape. Now, the last five questions that I save for you is actually trying to get to know the Kevin, the, the human Kevin. Um, so. Uh, just to hear the, the humanity. So um, my first question to you is, um, what, what's the most important thing you want people to know about you and the work that you do? I mean, you're doing workshop, um, you're doing therapy, and you're also doing a bit of, you know, some activism, if you will. But what's the big message from Kevin? Hmm. You know, I'm just, you know, if I had to do my epitaph, it would be that, you know, he was a pretty good guy and he did his best. You know, I'm just kind of a humble person. Uh, I'm out there trying to do my best. I love my people. I care about uh, who I am. Um, I have extremely high integrity, and I expect you to have integrity too. Uh, and that, I think, comes through in my work. I'm very authentic. Um, what you see is what you get. And I think authenticity is one of the keys to good living. Uh, and I'm going to model that for you in sessions uh, with me. So I guess that's kind of the big picture. Uh, you know, the big picture is sort of I think we're at a really bad time in the world. And I, I want to help you make sense of that, you know. So if you need a, uh, someone to come in and, and kind of be with to sort out where we are as a, you know, as a civilization today, um, I'd like to help you make sense of that. I think that's my responsibility as a, a seasoned person in life to be able to help you do that. 
Absolutely. And Kevin, who inspires you both professionally and personally? Oh, I haven't thought about this in so long. Um, professionally, I would have always said Carl Whitaker, and the, the students of family therapy would know who that is. Um, he was one of our best family therapists. Um, his authenticity always came through. He was kind of a no boundaries therapist. So he always sort of did what he, um, you know, felt was right in the moment. He didn't, he didn't get caught up in the cookbook of everything. So great therapist. Murray Bowen is another famous, you know, these are probably dinosaurs to some of the newbies out there. Um, but his theory of differentiation, of course, is really important. So uh, those two family therapists probably inspired me. Um, in terms of kind of political people right now, man, oh man, I, I don't even know who I would, I would point to. Uh, I'm, I'm not even... Um, I just don't think there's hard, there's hardly anyone I see on a daily basis that I think, wow, there's a person of integrity. Uh, I think that's really missing. So I have a hard time talking about kind of a, you know, uh, political people. But I think some of the nation's founders in the United States, I think John Adams uh, is inspirational. I watched his special on TV, the special about John Adams a few years ago on TV. And I thought that was a guy of all the founders that I probably admire the most for his integrity uh, and his courage. So um, folks that just do the right thing in the face of danger or in the face of, um, you know, pushback or when it's not popular, uh, those are the people that inspire me. You know, Jordan Peterson, when he first came out, he took the stand you know, in the trans issue. Um, I thought that was extremely powerful. Of course, he's paid a huge emotional toll. Uh, his whole and you know professional toll. So I, I found him to be very inspirational. But frankly, I was doing some Peterson before Peterson was Peterson. So I kind of felt like somebody else finally is sort of speaking out. He has a much bigger microphone than I have. Um, but I was really glad to uh, to see him. So I'm at a little bit of a loss. I think that is with the question because I really I'm not at a place now where I'm really finding a lot of heroes out there. I, I'm just. I'm just not. Um, I think we're in a bad place and heroes are kind of underground and, and I think we need more of them. We actually have a shared interest. I'm, I'm also big on Dr. Jordan Peterson fan. In fact, I'm actually reading one of his books, um, 12 Rules for Life. Um, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a brilliant book. Um, now, Kevin, what's your professional dream or do you even have one? So I, I recently started a church of mm -hmm. all things. So. Um, I decided that I'm at the stage in my career, obviously, where I want to do more kind of preaching. You know, I think this is what happens when you get a little bit older. Um, I, I'm not happy with just helping people kind of discover themselves at this point. I want, I want to preach. I want to say what I think is healthy and happy. So um, I started a church. I've called it the Living a Good Life Church. And you can find it at livingagoodlifechurch.org. Uh, it's kind of a secular church with a kind of European, Christian, and pagan influence in it. So I hope to spend the next 15 or 20 years of my professional life building that church, building the membership, and living out the values of that church. And I'm currently trying to figure out how best to incorporate the church into my um, you know, psychotherapy life. How can I do that ethically and practically uh, so that it kind of blends well together seamlessly? Um, so... The church is just going to be a place for people to get together. It's going to be a church of healthy boundaries uh, and a church of integrity and common sense. Um, I just think people are, are looking for a place places to land where they can have be around other people with integrity or other people that have good boundaries or the people that are moving forward in life uh, successfully. So um, just launched the church Six months ago, uh, I became a pastor, so I'm actually a pastor now. Um, I registered the church as a nonprofit so I can take donations. So check out the website. Let me know what you think about it. Um, but it's just, it's inspiring me. I've been inspired to move forward on a moral basis in life, not so much on a um, psychological basis in life. And it, it may push me out of the profession altogether uh, into pastoral kind of life, pastoral care. Uh, but, but I think that would be an exciting way to kind of end my life, doing something that I think is meaningful that way. Absolutely. Um, a place that fosters some common sense and integrity. Well, we definitely need more of that. Um, now, Kevin, um, what do you think you would be doing if you didn't work as a psychotherapist or as a pastor? <laughs> yeah, I think if you go back in my history, 
like my family, uh, I would have been a priest probably. People in my birth order, generational trajectory in my family, a lot of them became priests. So it's possible I would have been a priest in a, a couple generations um, back. Um, aside from that, I don't, I don't really know what else. I'm, unfortunately, I'm, I'm one of those guys that talks well. I don't build well, so um, I, you know, I don't. Um, I couldn't be a, a tradesperson because uh, I just don't have the skills in that area. So, you know, maybe a priest, a teacher, certainly. I think you know, I teach some college classes, and I think I'm pretty good at that. So, that could I could have easily seen myself getting you know becoming a college professor or some, something like that um, as well. But Probably that I, I I'm an I'm an idea architect, so I'm a strong builder in terms of ideas. So I suppose I could have been a, a, a creative person in some other endeavor, you know, an entrepreneur. I started five businesses because I like the starting phase of things. So it's possible I could have been uh, you know a business person, you know, kind of one of these uh, serial entrepreneurs that just starts kind of businesses or buys businesses that type of thing. I suppose that would have suited my personality too. Okay. And finally, Kevin, what else is in the pipeline um, aside from your um, um, religious work? And if people wanted to reach out to you, what platforms can they get in touch with you at? Of course, I'll put in the, the link to your website and the link to your church. Okay, yeah, I got kicked off some of the platforms because it was too controversial. So, um, but so probably the church and my website are the best uh, places to um, to find me. I think you can go there. I'm also trying to start something. Right now, it's a fictitious organization. It's very controversial, but it's called the National Psychotherapy Organization. No, National Psychotherapy is Association, NPA. So it's nationalpsychotherapyassociation.org. You can check that out. Uh, it's very much in the vein of what I talked about earlier, which is you know kind of a pro-whiteness alternative to the anti-whiteness zeitgeist that's out there. Uh, take a look at that. It's fictitious because I don't know if anybody will join because uh, it is too. I'm really putting it out there more as a way of uh, like a lightning rod uh, to get attention to the need for something like this, whether or not it becomes anything or not. Um, it's worth taking a look at. And I do talk a lot about, <clears throat> excuse me, natural law, the way things are, uh, that there's truth in the world, you know, um, and that we should really function from truth and integrity. Um the things that we know are real rather than this kind of postmodern nonsense that's, that suggests that there's nothing real and nothing durable. So you can check that out. That's another um, endeavor I have going going on. So my psychotherapy work, the pastoral work, community organizing. Oh, and also you mentioned the um, Dr. Canfield before. I'm actually the main chair of the new International Association for Psychology and Counseling. So you can go to that association, you'll find me as the main chair. I'm going to really help them to develop that in my part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, it's, it's a small world because um, we're likely to be working together. Um, nice. I had a discussion with Dr. Brian Canfield and um, nice. I, I play some sort of leadership role. I, I was just going to say before we end, um, Kevin, um, you, you said that you, you're working with um, an fictitious organization, NPA, and you said it's kind of um, controversial. I, I was about to ask you why it's controversial and you already explained it. But I suppose that the, the bottom line here is that, you know, um, other ethnicity, other group, you give them the opportunity to, you know, collectively um, bind together. So I don't think that white people should be an exception. Um, if, 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 you know, um, BAME can form a group of their own, if, if people who look like me can form a group of my own, um, I, I don't see any reason why um, people of your group um, should, not, should be prevented from um, forming um, your own group. Um, we leave it there, Kevin. Um, it's a pleasure having you here on the VRX show. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. Um, I look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you very much for having me.